Hey everyone, I'm the Canadian Lad, and today I'm going to be breaking down Spider-Man No Way Home scene by scene and try to give you some details that you may have overlooked in theaters. Now this will be part one of my breakdown and part two will cover the second half of the movie. I had to split this video into two because I wrote a 50 minute script. I mean, that's how many hidden details and clues I found in this movie. Now editing a 50 minutes video all by myself is a little too tough for me. Now full disclosure, this is not a point to Fabric Speed breakdown, but I'll have you know that I went and watched this movie eight times in the theaters. I did it because because I didn't want to miss any of the hidden details or easter eggs, which explains why I'm the latest to upload my breakdown of the movie. But of course, it's a bit tough watching a film on the big screen and taking notes at the same time, so I'm just waiting until we get the Blu-ray version, and then I will watch it at point two fabric speed properly. But having said that, I guarantee you this video won't disappoint you. I mean, I spotted some details that no one else did yet. But before I begin my longest breakdown on the channel, please spare me just 48 seconds to thank today's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Surfshark VPN is a fantastic tool for literally anyone who uses the internet. Surfshark VPN helps create a secure internet connection by concealing your IP address and encrypting your data so it's protected. As it's now the holiday season, I'm allowed to take a break from strictly watching Marvel movies and I always like to throw on classics like National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. But notice it isn't on Netflix in Canada. But by changing my country through Surfshark VPN, I'm able to watch The Santa Claus on Sweden's Netflix. And Surfshark VPN does so much more. For example, I can also find great deals while shopping. By changing my location, I can often snag deals catered to certain countries like discounts on flights. And if you're still not convinced, Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's nothing to lose. Click on my link in the description and enter my code CANADIANLAD to save 83% plus get 3 months free. Now this movie picks up exactly from where we left off in Far From Home. Peter's identity gets revealed by Mysterio, and J. Jonah Jameson has already framed Peter Parker as public enemy number one. Peter and MJ both get shackled by the crowd, as they all want answers whether or not he killed Mysterio. Now one detail that they added in this scene that wasn't in Far From Home is this Black Dahlia necklace. Peter had bought it for MJ to give it as a gift, but it got broken during the final fight in Far From Home. This necklace will actually play a bigger role at the end of the film. I'll talk about it in part two. Peter then swings MJ through Times Square, and we see this billboard that says, Electrifying Your Journey, which is clearly foreshadowing Jamie Foxx's Electro. We then see MJ trying to balance herself on the Queens Borough Bridge. This was the same bridge where Green Goblin dropped MJ back in Spider-Man 1. We even see Peter closing a manhole cover with his web. Now the way John Watts, the director of the movie, sold focused on the manhole cover indicates he's trying to tell us something. And I think what it means is, at the end of Amazing Spider-Man 2, Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man actually used a manhole cover to attack a rhino. So Andrew picks up the manhole cover while we see Tom closing it. Another implication that this movie will actually rectify and redeem everything that went wrong in the Amazing Spider-Man 2. So within the first minute of the movie, we already got three references to three previous villains. Now this happened in front of a store that Peter regularly visits in Spider-Man Homecoming. But notice now it says Delmar's 3 and instead of just Delmar, which could be referring to the fact that this is Tom Holland's third Spidey film. Or maybe because three is the magic number. Now back in the apartment, Aunt May breaks up with Happy, but Happy is desperate to patch things up again. They catch Peter and MJ in an awkward position. Another reminiscent of Aunt May walking on Ned and Peter like this in Homecoming. Peter and MJ then close all the windows at the apartment, but he had to web one particular window shade twice, because he failed the first time. And notice he opens the shade without any difficulty, that he just webbed up a few seconds ago. Now, we learned in Homecoming that Peter's web actually takes two hours to dissolve. Hey, that's gonna dissolve in two hours. No, 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 no. Come fix this. So the fact that Peter could open this webbed up window with such ease again shows the incredible strength he possesses. Also notice how Peter is wearing the same I survived my trip to NYC shirt which he wore back in Spider-Man Homecoming. But look at the way it fits him now compared to Homecoming. Boy, Tom is really growing up in front of our eyes, eh? Cut to J. Jonah Jameson who is reporting on Peter Parker and on the screen we can see a bunch of posters made by the supporters of Mysterio. One of them even says it was better when you were blipped. Basically saying the world was better when Peter was dead for five years. And some are even saying lock Peter up. So you can understand the effect this sort of propaganda would have on a teenager. No wonder Peter winds up asking Doctor Strange to make everyone forget his alter identity. Now Daily Beagle is broadcasting this made-up mugshot of Peter, MJ, and Ned using their yearbook photos. And for the first time in the MCU, we get to know MJ's full name, Michelle Jones Watson. Another subtle way this movie connects itself back to Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 1. It even says the trial of terror on the front. So another mention of the word three. The next slide shows Time Magazine calling Tom 
becomes Spider-Man Iron Man Jr. and in touch weekly named him Two-Faced. I don't know if it's a deliberate DC reference, but of course it also exists in the comics where Peter's face is half him and half Spider-Man. Then we see someone throwing green paint on Peter and shouting Mysterio forever. This is actually from a deleted scene where Tom's Spider-Man stops a burglar and that burglar was played by Tom's real-life brother Harry Holland. The whole point of Peter getting thrown green paint at him was to be able to make him wear his suit inside out later in the film, therefore giving us the black and gold suit. Now in a different broadcast, there's a new Skyrun that says political turmoil continues in New Asgard, which means Valkyrie who has made the king of Asgard by Thor himself might be having some issues ruling without the help of Thor who is off-world with the Guardians. We then learn that the government is actively investigating Stark Industries, as the drones found in London were properties of Stark Industry, and on this ground, the government issues a warrant for Peter's arrest. And notice in this scene where Peter and Aunt May are watching the news on TV, in the trailer we were made to believe they're watching the Daily Bugle, but in the movie it has now been replaced and shows footage of the government seizing the drones from Stark Industries. The Department of Damage Control or DODC then apprehends not only Peter Parker, but Aunt May, Ned and MJ as well. Basically everyone who has ever associated with Peter Parker. They take a lot of photos of Peter's apartment as evidence, and there we see a framed picture of Ned and MJ. Now MJ also has the same picture hanging on her bedroom wall. And notice Peter has a book called Ultimate Anagram Puzzle Book, which I think belongs to John Watts, the director of the movie, more so than it does to the character Peter Parker, because he plays with words and puts them as easter eggs either in the backgrounds or license plates. We can also see Peter's Star Wars figurine, which I'll talk about just give me a moment. The DODC then takes photos of the charging station, but notice it doesn't have the Iron Spider suit in it, which could only mean that Peter was wearing it at the time. As we know, because of nanotech, he can pretty much make it invisible to the naked eye. But Peter was at home in his pajamas when he got arrested, so why would he wear the nano suit to instead of putting it back on the charging station? Well, I think it's because he was scared. He was scared seeing all this negative news about him. As a result, he had the suit on at all times, and notice he didn't keep the Edith glasses in a safe spot. It's just there in his bedroom, and that means ever since the whole Mysterio fiasco, Peter now doesn't care much about Edith. In fact, he'd like to stay away from it. Cut to Peter getting interrogated by the DODC, and he's wearing the same physics as theoretical but the fun is real t-shirt that he also wore back in Homecoming. Peter then sees Aunt May, MJ, and Ned are all brought here as well for questioning. Notice Aunt May and MJ both advise Peter not to say anything without a lawyer, but Ned is quiet and scared, indicating both Aunt May and MJ have some sort of an idea of how legal issues work, but Ned has no clue, which is why he ends up being the only one who winds up confessing everything. Then this DODC officer suggests Aunt May to lawyer up, and questions her integrity as she not only endangered Peter but also encouraged it. Pay attention to these words. This is actually foreshadowing the plot of the film. When all the villains get stuck here and Peter is ready to send them home, it's Aunt May who stops him and tells him to fix them first. So this officer is actually right. Aunt May does encourage Peter to do a lot of dangerous stuff. But then to everybody's surprise, we get our first big cameo of Matt Murdock played by Charlie Cox, who is now counseling Peter, clearing him from all the charges. Now notice Peter calls him Mr. Murdock, while Aunt May calls him by his first name, Matt, which might tell us that May didn't just hire a random lawyer. She knew Matt Murdock from before. And then to make things even better, Marvel actually teases Matt's powers as he catches a brick thrown at Peter. But notice, even if Matt couldn't catch it, Peter's spidey sense had already warned him of what's coming, and he was already in motion to catch the brick even without looking. No pun intended there. And this is what I love about Marvel. Had Peter not attempted to catch it, every one of us would have complained, where is his spidey sense? But the fact that both Matt and Peter had a go at it, and Matt only caught it because he was near to it, again shows how much effort Marvel puts in writing a scene like this. Now this brick was of course thrown by an advocate of Mysterio, but it seems as though this particular Mysterio supporter doesn't know how to spell the word believe. Also notice how Peter and Aunt May are using the negative press against Peter and putting those newspapers up in the window. This particular news talks about how Peter's webs are always the cause of massive destruction. It even has pictures of the ferry that Peter destroyed in Homecoming and the Washington Monument and the Tower Bridge in Far From Home. In all three scenarios, Peter was trying to save lives, not destroy valuable public property. Now another reason why Peter may be using bits of newspapers in his windows could be because this isn't the first time someone broke his window and threw something at his apartment. Maybe this glass is broken as well and this is their way to cover it. Now as this place isn't safe anymore, they all move to Happy's apartment, and just as they enter, the alarm goes off, and Aunt May quickly presses a few buttons to deactivate it. Now notice the alarm system that Happy has was asking for a specific ID code, so you can just input random numbers to deactivate it. The system has to have your ID, so the fact that Aunt May could disable it means she has her own ID to enter Happy's apartment, or maybe Happy sharing his. I mean, who knows? This guy's crazy about May. Also notice how Happy has a bunch of other ID cards hanging right by the screen. 
which is a callback to his obsession with IDing everyone in Iron Man 3. Badge, guys. I put a memo in the toilet. Come on. Then we see Happy also has Dummy in his apartment. Now here we can spot a DVD of Downtown Abbey, which we learned was Happy's favorite show after Tony mentioned it in Iron Man 3. And notice how many bags and luggage Peter is carrying all by himself, while Aunt May only has one backpack. I love subtle details like this that cleverly show us Peter's strength. Peter then finds out Happy also has possession of Tony Stark's fabricator, the machine that we saw at the back of the private jet which Peter used to make his new suit. Peter and MJ then FaceTime each other, and during that we get to see MJ's bedroom. Now even though I discovered almost all the details from MJ's room, but I'm gonna point them out again for the sake of giving this video its own identity. She has a photo of herself, another photo with Ned, the same one that we saw in Peter's house, and this picture is from Far From Home where Brad Davis took this photo of MJ in Venice with a bunch of pigeons. And of course there were sketches of Peter Parker and Coach Wilson that MJ made herself in Homecoming. MJ then asks Peter if he feels relieved now that the whole world knows he's Spider-Man. We of course have seen it multiple times in the trailer already, but in the trailer Peter replies back asking her what do you mean? Does any part of you feel relieved about all this? What do you mean? However, in the movie, Peter doesn't say what do you mean. He just stays quiet for a few seconds and thinks about what to answer. Now, this may not seem like a significant detail, but let me tell you it is. Because the trailer version makes it seem like Peter and MJ are not on the same page in that conversation. But in the movie, they both know what they're talking about. Then we see Betty Brandt hosting the Midtown News. And she says, go get him, Tiger. Which, of course, is the nickname MJ had for Peter Parker in the comics. And in Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2. Now, Peter's school has a mural with the greatest inventors of the world. Previously in Homecoming, we only saw Howard Stark from the MCU, but now they have added more characters within the universe in the mural. It has Abraham Erskine, the scientist who turned Steve Rogers into Captain America. And it also has Hank Pym just above Einstein. I mean, they had to, right? Hank Pym's Pym particle basically allowed the Avengers to go back in time and reverse Thanos' snap. Mr. Harrington, Mr. Dell, and Coach Wilson then all welcome Peter back at school. And Mr. Harrington even prepared a little something to welcome Peter with. Notice he even photoshopped himself in a photo of MJ and Peter. But notice, he has a sketch which is half Peter Parker and half Spider-Man, just like in the comics, which John Watts follows all the way through to the end credits. And this TV screen, which previously showed Betty Brandt, has now been replaced with some other footage, meaning Marvel and Sony wanted to show in the trailer itself that the character of Betty Brandt will be in this film. Cut to the rooftop, which is Peter's happy place. He feels at peace over here, far away from everyone else and all the chaos. Now the article that MJ is reading here frames both Ned and MJ for being accomplices in Peter's crimes. Also, notice this graffiti on the wall behind Peter and MJ. It says Ditko. Now Steve Ditko co-created both Spider-Man and Doctor Strange and now they're finally in a solo movie together. Peter, Ned and MJ all decide to apply for MIT and settle down in Boston. A new place, a new start. Now while Peter gets denied at every college, Dummy over here is actually reassembling the Death Star. But then the results come in from MIT and Dummy drops it down just like Ned in Homecoming. Now out of excitement, Peter, Ned and MJ decide to open up the letters from MIT all at the same time. Now notice how Peter got here in the first place. He now swings all out in the open without any mask, as everyone now knows he's Spider-Man. But notice he wasn't actually swinging here. There were no webs involved. In fact, he made a really high jump and landed just in front of the restaurant MJ works at. Now, making bigger and higher jumps is actually one of Spider-Man's abilities in the comics, and I'm so happy they finally showed it in live action. Then they come to know they have all been rejected at MIT, due to all the recent events that have practically ruined their reputation. Seeing both Ned and MJ suffer for no fault of their own, Peter feels guilty, so he decides to seek Doctor Strange's help and see if it's possible to make everyone forget his Spider-Man. Wong comes through a portal and we can see in the background that he's returning from the London Sanctum Sanctorum. Notice how he was already wearing a heavy jacket even when he was in London. So Wong basically came prepared as he was about to enter the New York Sanctum. Wong then explains that one of the rotunda gateways to Siberia was left open and a blizzard blasted through, therefore the snow in the Sanctum. But I don't buy that entirely. Why would the writers write something so simple for the production budget to go that high? So there must be another reason, and we may get the actual answer in Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. We then learn that Wong now holds the position of the Sorcerer Supreme, and not Strange, as he was blipped for five years. Strange then says he cannot go back in time and undo whatever happened, because he no longer has the Time Stone. But Peter says it's not about him, it's affecting the people around him, the people that know him. This one line was actually enough to convince Strange to help him, because Peter is seeing the bigger picture, not only asking for it for selfish reasons. Strange had gone through a series of events to learn a similar lesson from Ancient One. Arrogance and fear still keep you from learning the simplest and most significant lesson of all. Which is? It's not about you. 
So when he saw Peter already feels it, Strange felt compelled to help him with the runes of Cough Call. Basically a spell that will make everyone in the world forget that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. But notice in the movie, they actually changed the dialogues of Wong and removed the bit where Steven winks at Peter. Wong now says, just leave me out of this, instead of saying, don't cast that spell. I think it was a necessary change because now in the movie, both Wong and Strange agreed to help Peter Parker, so that in Multiverse of Madness, it doesn't only remain a Strange's fault. Now it's on both of them. Then the spell goes horribly wrong as Peter changed it five times, and the last change that he made was enough to crack open the multiverse, because he said, and I quote, basically everyone who knew that I was Spider-Man before should still know. This one change during the spell started pulling in everyone from different universes in here, who knows Peter Parker is Spider-Man. And I like how Peter changed the spell five times and ended up bringing five separate villains from the multiverse. Now, as the spell was breaking apart, the first silhouette that we see is probably of the lizard. I'm guessing this by the looks of this tale. Cut to this famous bridge where Peter is trying to find the MIT assistant vice chancellor so that he can plead his case and get his friends a second chance at MIT. Now, Peter arrived on this bridge wearing his Iron Spider suit. Notice how his wings dissolve into his body as he makes his landing. Not only that, his entire suit actually dissolves into the small device. So now Peter can wear whatever he wants inside his nano suit because this suit has the ability to overlap with anything. And in his heads up display, we can see that Edith is currently offline. And so are most of the suit's abilities. Because the DODC is currently investigating Stark Industries, I'm guessing the main server might be down as well. Now the next detail is one of my favorites. Notice when he still had the nano suit on, his shadow matched his suit. Precisely the shape of his head I'm talking about here. It was round. But when he disables the armor, his shadow changes as well and reflects his current attire, which is a formal everyday suit. I mean, the attention to detail in this film is baffling. They even CGI Tom's shadow that automatically increases the authenticity of the film. Now, Peter walks past this car with the license plate that reads S-E-Y-S-1-P-3. Now, a lot of people have sent me emails with this detail that it basically spells Spidey's plural if you rearrange the letters, but that's not true. This plate needs a D in it for it to be able to spell Spidey's. Not that D, but what if I tell you it still spells Spidey's even without a D in it? Now, John Watts went really crazy with this one, and instead of inserting a simple D, he slipped in 1 and 3. And when you put them together, it kind of looks like the word Spidey's with another 3 in the middle. A very clever easter egg foreshadowing Toby and Andrew. Now, coming to this MIT lady's car, well, her license plate also makes a comic book reference. It says 63A5M, or 63ASM, which obviously stands for 63 Amazing Spider-Man. This is a reference to the first appearance of Dr. Octopus in the comics, Amazing Spider-Man number 3 released in 1963. Now, a lot of people have pointed out already that this taxi number is a hidden easter egg, referencing the great Stan Lee. It says 1228. It's a reference to Stan Lee's birthday, December 28, 1922. Now, let me add a little more information so you love this detail even more. In behind-the-scenes footage, you can see that this taxi didn't have this number, while the rest of the plates were physically real. So they went out of their way to later CGI this detail in the film as a tribute to the great Stan Lee. So point to be noted, always pay attention to license plates in a movie when John Watts is directing it. Dr. Octopus then arrives in the scene and we get this massive fight between them. Now, I've broken down this particular scene way too many times now, so I won't repeat it again. Please watch my trailer breakdown if you want to know. It's all there. Doc Ogg then absorbs Peter's nanotech, which is actually possible because in Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2, we learned that Otto made his mechanical arms using nanotechnology. These smart arms are controlled by my brain through a neural link. Nanowires. Even Norman Osborn was actively working on nanotech. I read all your research on nanotechnology. Really brilliant. So Doc Ock, who borrowed most of his tech from Oscorp Industries, it would make sense if his arms are built using nanotech as well. And that's why he was able to absorb Peter's nano suit. But that didn't end well for him, did it? Now, Peter could take control of his mechanical arms because this tech works both ways. This was brilliant piece of writing. The fact that the writers thought of this and then pulled it off deserves an applause. But then Green Goblin shows up and before anything happens, Strange portals both Peter and Doc Ock back to the basement. Now, if you think about it, from Peter's perspective, he teleported back to the basement. But from Green Goblin's perspective, he just saw two separate individuals get vanished within seconds. So right from this scene, the Goblin realized there's something different about this place. Now, in the basement, Doctor Strange has already captured Lizard, who was the first to appear when the multiverse cracked open, so it makes sense he's the first one to get caught as well. Peter then brings in Ned and MJ to help him catch the rest of the villains. He takes out his old suit, which is still wrapped in green paint. Come to think of it, Peter actually called in Ned so that he would bring Peter's old Spidey suit, and that's why Ned was carrying a backpack while entering the Sanctum. Peter then tries out different cleaners to wipe the paint of the suit, and there we see the scary doll which turns and looks at Peter. MJ then goes on TikTok to find anything related to Green Goblin. She even finds a goatee guard in the basement, which explains how Strange has such perfect goatee all the time. Ned then finds out where Electro is, and there Peter also comes across Sandman aka Flint Marco. Now, can I just take a second to say that I love this black and gold suit? I mean, because 
it's an inside out suit so we can see the wires hanging down, which I don't think is safe in it. I mean imagine Electro just simply takes a few wires out and boom, Peter can no longer operate in his suit. Anyway, Sandman actually helps Peter defeat Electro. Because back in Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 3, Flint and Peter both ended their stories on good terms. Peter then brings Electro and Sandman to the basement prison. But notice when he webs Sandman using Doctor Strange's magic to teleport him to this prison cell, the expression on Peter's face is really telling something. He's not happy capturing Flint Marco. Because Flint just helped him capture Electro. So right from the get-go, Peter didn't like the idea of capturing all these beings, let alone capturing someone who just helped him win a fight. Then we see Green Goblin, played by Willem Dafoe, talking to his inner demon. The Goblin tells him, and I quote, We have a new world to conquer. So this immediately tells us that out of all the five villains, Green Goblin was the only one who realized that this is a different universe. Even though Norman couldn't see it, but Green Goblin could. As a result, Norman shatters his Goblin helmet, in hopes that it would kill the Goblin. But as Norman walks away from the broken helmet, the Goblin still kept laughing, indicating that breaking a physical piece of suit won't kill the Goblin, because the Goblin exists inside him. And notice the way John Watts captured this scene. It mirrors the shot of Toby's Peter Parker tossing a Spider-Man suit in a trash can from Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2. Peter then goes to the Feast facility, which basically gives free food and shelter to the homeless. Peter and Aunt May both worked for this facility in the comics as well. Now, some mysterious supporter has also vandalized this billboard outside, and even painted Peter's mask with a green circle, kinda mirroring mysterious fishbowl helmet. We then see that Norman Osborn has taken shelter in this facility, and has totally presented himself as a helpless man who is slowly losing his mental stability. Now, notice when Aunt May called Peter over the phone and told him about Norman Osborn, it was 7.27 in the morning, and when Peter reached the Feast facility, it was 8.10, so it took him about 40 minutes to swing there. That must be so exhausting. Now, notice how Norman Osborn is wearing a green coat over his purple hoodie. That's the most comic accurate colored costume for Green Goblin in live action so far. Aunt May then tells Peter to help Norman, but Peter says it's not his problem. But as I said at the beginning of the video, Aunt May is someone who pretty much has always encouraged Peter to help others, even if it puts him in danger. Now, if you think Tom's Peter was wrong to take someone else's problem on his head and suffered, well, Toby's Peter in his film avoided intervening in someone else's problem, but he still suffered. Uncle Ben was still killed. So no matter what this Peters do, their fateful destiny of losing the one they love will definitely take place. We then see J. Jonah Jameson in a better and a more equipped set. So he's probably earning a lot of money spitting all that bullshit about Spider-Man. All the villains then get in one place and discuss what is really going on. They learn that all of them have one common factor, and that is they all get killed because of their universe's Spider-Man, except for Dr. Connors and Flint Marco. But then Strange shows up with this magical box, which would allow him to reverse the spell and send them all back home. But most of them, of course, don't want to go back, as it would mean they die almost immediately after returning. Peter then asks Strange to be a little bit more empathetic, but Strange says in the grand calculus of the multiverse, their sacrifice meant infinitely more than their lives. And I love the dialogues of this film. Now this line shows the basic principle Strange follows. If someone's death ends up bringing more good to the humankind, Strange wouldn't hesitate for a second to sacrifice them. And that's it for this breakdown. I'm already working on the second part as you were watching this video. Please make sure to watch the second part when I drop it. Should be done in a couple more days. My second part of the breakdown will cover the second half of the movie, so you can already guess how many more hidden details and easter eggs I'm gonna reveal in that one, especially from the scenes where Toby, Andrew, and Tom are all together. So please grab the subscribe button and turn notifications on so you don't miss it when it's uploaded. Um, give me a thumbs up as well if I was able to unveil some details that I missed in your first viewing. Till then, I'll see you lads in part 2. I won't be spoken to in that manner. You talking back to me?